Good to have you all here. <laughs> Excited to close the 2018 edition of Slush by kind of reminiscing the phenomenal year in European tech this year, 2018, and looking forward to what's going to happen in 2019. Um, just to drop a couple facts of what has actually went down and why it's especially great to have these people here today um, is that we've had four uh, technology IPOs or direct listings from Europe uh, that have been valued at more than $5 billion. Um, and out of those four, Spotify and Farfetch were two. So essentially 50% of, of the companies are represented here one way or the another. Or much more than 50%. Or yeah, as of the valuation. Value. Yes, that's true. <laughs> much more than 50% if you look at just the valuation. Uh, yeah, both as people who were building the companies as well as board members. So all perspectives, perspectives represented. Um, but not just that, uh, Europe has also received a record number of funding so far. Um, as of today, uh, it's $23 billion that have been invested to European tech this year. Uh, and that's up quite a lot from 2013 when it was just $5 billion. So it's five times bigger in five years, which is massive. So de definitely there's been a lot of Im improvement and development, but there's obviously things that we can, we can still change in the ecosystem to be even better. And that's, that's the topic for the day. But to get started off like, our journey and how we got there, um, maybe starting actually from PJU, you, you just recently returned to Europe, but looked at Europe from the US for a long time. Yeah. How did you, like, how do you see building a company look like in, in the US or US founders versus in Europe? I think uh, there is a distinctive difference on how Europeans go about uh, building companies. And, uh, and Americans have a tendency to believe in their assumptions and to uh, basically <clears throat> rely on that those assumptions uh, will hold uh, which means that they are prepared to take a little bit more risk uh, in parallel to things uh, how they are, are unfolding. And that's something that I've uh, uh, tried to uh, communicate to many of, of the uh, uh, entrepreneurs here in Europe. And uh, as the capital market has become much more complete in Europe, there is no reason why an entrepreneur shouldn't think the same way in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I... I guess um, from my perspective, or from Index's perspective, I think I would probably say that the difference is more in the approach to presenting rather than the ambition. It's right. that um, US entrepreneurs tend to be super polished when they express their enthusiasm and their ability to dominate and to disrupt an industry. And Europeans have a tendency to be more subdued and uh, more self-doubting when they present. But the ambition is usually there. So it's, you know, it's been interesting for us because at Index, half our firm now is in San Francisco and half our firm is in London. And it's always, it's always interesting to see that we as a partnership have to adapt ourselves depending on who's presenting. Like when it's a European entrepreneur, we have to connect the dots more. And yeah. when it's a US entrepreneur, we actually have to take a step back and, and just remember that they're going to be painting <clears throat> the best light possible. So it's been interesting to see those cultural differences. Yeah. So I guess it's believing in yourself and be proud about it when yeah. going forward. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any better or worse. It's just a different approach. Yeah. Um, companies represented here are more or less the strengths of Europe, right? Like fashion music, uh, what we're known for, 80, 90% of all luxury brands come from Europe. Um, how's it been to build a company in that field from Europe and expanding to, you have a ton of offices all around the world, right? At, at yeah, Farfetch. so, yeah, well, I mean, when I joined, we were 30 people in, in London and Portugal, mainly. I think we had one in the US and one in Brazil, which is a whole other story. <laughs> um, and uh, now we're 3,200 in, in 13 offices. So, uh, but I think that the starting point is, you know, I think obviously any company, wherever it is, needs something that differentiates it, something that gives it something special. And definitely in our case, you know, if you look at all of the successful 
or the vast majority of the successful fashion businesses, especially luxury online, they're all in Europe. And it's something that we have heritage in, we have history in, I think we have a, a and we have a connection to, you know, if you're going to work in the luxury space, you need to be really close to the brands. And they're all in Paris and Milan predominantly. And so I do think that gives us a, a, a huge edge. I mean, I remember, I think it was our Series C, we went to Silicon Valley to try and raise yeah. money. It was kind of Jose and I going up and down Sand Hill Road in the SUV. You know, it's kind of a different experience to doing it in London. And you know, met some super smart, really brilliant, amazing people who just couldn't get our business. They just couldn't get it. They couldn't understand why would someone spend you know, $3,000 online for a dress? And, and why can't we just get Gucci to sell on Amazon? I mean, it doesn't, you know, I think there's just a, uh, uh, they, they, they would intellectually get it, but they never really fell in love with it, I think, the way that you know, European investors would straight away. Right. Is there any other like anecdotes like that that would I don't know you, you felt when you went uh, like beyond Europe where you would have <clears> like felt the differences? Not necessarily just in the U.S., but yeah, I, know, I mean, South I mean, America. Yeah, or I mean, I think I think Asia. I mean I mean one of the you know online luxury. It, it once you get over this question of will someone spend two thousand dollars on a dress online, which had been proven by some of the brilliant European companies that launched before us. It is the best e-commerce category in the world, or one of. It's super high prices, high average order values, high margins, global brands, global product catalog, customers who are global. And obviously, the internet has built an incredible ecosystem for building global businesses with those kinds of dynamics. Um, and so there's a lot of commonality, um, much more so, I think, in luxury potentially than in others. And, and it's hard to get access to the brands. So that's really what I think enabled us to go global. But the differences are incredible. I mean. You know, I think you know, we're talking, I hear a lot of debate here around the difference between the US and Europe, but if you go to China, it's a whole, I mean, that is a whole, that is a different world in terms of, I think the, you know, I remember the first time I went to China was maybe six years ago thinking about, you know, how would we launch there? And, and, and I was at eBay many years before that where eBay had made it a number one priority. You know, it's like, they had a slide saying like, our number one priority is China. I have a slide like that as well. <laughs> uh, eBay's didn't go so well, you know, it was not, and admittedly they were early and they learned a lot. And um, you, you get there, and you read, the thing that stunned me, it's changed a bit, but at the time, people talked about China copying US businesses in particular. I think it's an incredibly imperialistic view of the world. I think they execute at a level I've not seen in any other country. Um, and you have to be able to both adapt to that and think about carefully, can you compete? And I think in our case, we're able to because of the, <coughs> the nature of the, the supply base. There's not too many companies who've done that. We actually, I think we'll be the first, yeah, or are exactly. the first in terms of, and it's a personal pet passion of mine to become the first non-Chinese internet business to really make it there. And uh, you know, I think we're on, we're on a great track there. It's our, you know, our second largest market and continues to be, to be super important for us. Sweet. Um, Stefan, I'd like to know a little bit more about the like, everyday life of building Spotify. Eventually, it is the biggest listing of the year from Europe, and I think it's something that people waited for quite a long time to happen. Yep. Um, but what, what it, like, if you talk a little bit more about the, like, what, what's the rhythm within the company and, and the ambition level inside? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, and actually, I want to mention something that PJ mentioned before we got on stage, which is uh, it's fairly interesting, right, that from this very region, you have uh, not just one huge startup, mm. not a startup anymore, but you also had a ton of other companies coming out, uh, like the, the foundation of Beat Music that was bought by Apple, actually came from Sweden, uh, combined team Sweden, Norway, Tidal, the same thing. Um, there's a bunch of new music companies out there, like Epidemic Sound, for instance, yeah. uh, Soundtrack Your Brand, so there's a slew of companies out there. And I really think that happened, and then I'll get on to your question, because um, there was this moment in time, right, where you had pretty a uh, pretty big, big challenge for consumers. You had access to music, but not in any great way. Uh, and clearly, a lot of people were seeing that creators aren't being compensated in a fair, mm. fair way. Um, so those two things happened in the same time space as in, in infrastructure came in place. So you had high-speed mobile networks, mobile phones coming in, smartphones coming in, and a couple of um, really passionate people saw that opportunity and grabbed it, basically. Um, so that's really why I think it happened at that time. Um, and then I think the rhythm and the planning of the company that has changed over the time and now I'm not with the company anymore, but we tried various iterations as to how to plan and set strategy and what have you. And I think what we found most useful, uh, is, at least in the last few years, is to set up really North Star goals, like long-term goals, 
uh, so people know the long-term direction of the company because obviously it's quite difficult to detail down what's going to happen this month, this quarter, and these two years. So basically Spotify was operating under a North Star, like five, seven years perspective, and then a two-year set of goals that were really detailed. Um, and in developing those, that happened sort of through the course of uh, what's called strategy days and uh, in, in management meetings. And, um, and the, the structure around that is really to talk about beliefs. Where do we think the market will be? Where do we think the consumer will be in terms of consumption? Where do we think the creators and the industry overall will be? And from that, we can develop targets, basically. Um, rather than actually saying, this is what the market is, and just extend that, because it's really about creating new opportunities and reshaping uh, some, of the, some of the old. Yeah. yeah. Something that I could continue from that is that success breeds success. Like you said, uh, Epidemic Sound or other companies that are doing music, it's not just Spotify, or essentially Farfetch is just a continuum of the strong fashion and luxury uh, history that we have in Europe. So is there, what could we do as Europe even better to like, accelerate this success breeds success wheel? I, I think uh, we had, unfortunately, back uh, maybe 15 or so years ago, there was this idea of building your company and then selling it to someone. Uh, and, and that sort of uh, killed the boss for very many uh, ecosystems. But then maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, the first example started to, to appear where the entrepreneurs, and I think Daniel Ek and Martin Lawrence are, are probably the, the most brilliant examples of that they decided they wanted to build their own company and remain their own company. And that has had a tremendous effect and, and, and implication of other entrepreneurs have looked at their quest also going forward. And that, you know, just looking at Spotify today, they have given birth to more than 25 companies from alumni uh, Spotify people. And, and they are raising capital, they are recruiting people, and the same goes probably for the Farfetch uh, alumni as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember, um, you know, we had the same, I think it was very ingrained in European companies back when we started that your goal was to sell to probably an American company. Yeah. Right? That was the, the standard MO. And, and uh, it was only Series D that we started seriously thinking about going public. And I definitely, you know, if there's one thing I would say to all the companies here is that you should think, you should start thinking about that now. I mean, there must be, I don't know, what, what are the odds? There's maybe 20, 30 public companies here already. They just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so you should start thinking like that. And I think things have, have changed now. But I mean, the other, the other thing I remember vividly was when I first met Jose. It was in this shitty little cafe in East London. Um, it was my interview. He spent the hour talking to me. And then uh, I think I asked him, you know, one of the main questions I asked him was, what's your exit plan? And he said, I don't have one. And I thought that was exactly the right answer, unless he'd say go public. But he mm -hmm. said, you know, because if he'd said to me, you know, I want to build it up and sell it in three years, well, I, would, I personally would not have joined. So I think it's very, you know, if you care about what you're building, then surely eventually going public is the best route. It allows you to, to, to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Right. And let me touch on one comment you said that, you know, you should start thinking about that road, you know, to IPO already earlier. Um, what in practice can the founders in the room do to kind of do things right early on? I, I mean, I think, look, would it have changed anything in terms of how decisions we'd have made or ways? I, I, I'm not sure it would have because we always had, we're always very clear on the, um, you know, the ambition was huge. I mean, Danny can talk to that more, but the, the ambition was huge. The market was huge. We wanted to revolutionize the fashion industry. And so I think that me, me, meant we were always thinking very, very big. Um, I don't know if we'd thought, well, it's all going to be about exiting and therefore we need to spend time building relationships with potential you know, people who can buy us or whatever, but we just never did that. You know, we, we spent almost zero time with people who contacted us or, or going outbound at all. But I just think it's about, you know, thinking as big as you can. And if you're thinking about sell, I mean, some companies obviously are more, are not candidates to go public, but if you are a potential candidate to go public, that should, in my opinion, that should be your, your ambition, not selling. Yeah, I, I mean, we have two really good examples here of executives who were essential in building the stories that we're talking about. I think um, you know, that's probably the area, I would say, um, that Europe has historically had the most uh, pushback on is 
not realizing the value of the team that you're building mm -hmm. around the entrepreneur. So the, the caliber of the entrepreneur, I think, is actually very similar, um, if not better here, because of the odds of building something that tremendous here. But knowing how critical the team is going to be for your success and making sure that you hire the best people who are better than you at every single job, that's a, that's a new learning. And certainly, you know, it's not as fluid a market here as, you know, say, Silicon Valley, but it certainly is as New York or these other places that people talk about as potential, you know, hubs of, of entrepreneurialism. So it's just making sure that there's a culture of hiring people who are better than you in every single job and not worrying about giving up control in those respective areas, but realizing that that's what's going to make you super successful. There's a cliche that I often remind my entrepreneurs about, like A players hire A players and B players hire C players. Mm. And it's really true. Like if you're not hiring A players, but you're hiring B players, the B players are going to hire people who are worse than them in every single case. And as a result of that, you don't really have a fighting chance. Yeah, I agree. And actually, that takes us nicely to a thought. I remember you said, Stefan, where we were preparing that uh, you spend even 30% of your time in hiring to make sure you have the right yeah, people. Yeah, probably more, around there. Or yeah. e even more. So it's just, yeah, I mean, it's not like you'll sit there and have interviews all the time, but you will seek to branch out and, and broaden your network, basically, to find fantastic people out there for the moment when you can offer them a position to basically sell them on the vision and, and get them excited and eventually, hopefully, get them on board. Um, so I think that's a very successful approach. Um, the other way around would obviously be hire a lot of headhunters, <coughs> and there's a lot of fantastic headhunters out there. But I think you need to combine that, actually, at least when you're hiring for uh, some certain positions, that you, you build that network yourself, basically. Yep. Yeah. And spend a lot of time nurturing that. Yeah. Right. And again, to the okay, entrepreneurs in the room, uh, any advice from your learnings on that? You know, A players hire A players. So how do you keep that bar high and actually raise it all the time? What, what do you need to do to make sure that your organization, when you have thousands of people already, you make sure that the pipeline is filled with only A players? How do you do that? I mean, I mean, I can, you know, from my if I look back on the, you know, the eight years I've been at Farfetch, my biggest mistakes have been hiring ones. So right. they're, they're the ones I've learned the most from. And they're the most painful because they take two years to fix. You know, if you get it wrong, by the time you've hired the person and then you see how they go and then you obviously want to give people a chance, give them some support and feedback, it's not working, then you exit them, then you start the process. I mean, it, it takes time, especially in Europe where there's a little bit less flexibility around, around you know, the, the way labor laws, et cetera, et cetera, work. Um, I mean, but, and to me, I, I really think the, this, there's a, the, the scalability is a lot more around kind of process and how you use that to drive consistency. But I think the core principles, uh, the, certainly the ones I've learned, are, I mean, the, the two big things I always remember are, you know, I remember when I first joined Farfetch, uh, one of our investors then told, there were two key roles he wanted me to hire. And I said, what's the budget? And he said, he gave me a number, which yeah. I knew was about half what it needed to be. And, and I said to him, well, look, you know, I, you know, I was, wasn't, I was still learning, and so and I said, and I wanted to impress him. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll try and do that. And I hired two people at that level, and I got people at that level. You know, the, the labor market is incredibly efficient. You're not going to get someone who's a, a role that's a 200 grand role for 100 grand or 100 grand for 50. It's just, and even if you do, it's a once in a, you know, it's a dream situation. So I think you have to be realistic. Decide what you want. The market price is that. And if you can't afford it, then change your, change yep. your plan. And I have never regretted over hiring. I've never regretted hiring someone more expensive, more senior, more experienced. I have really regretted doing the reverse. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why also, you know, mm. diversity is so important in the early days in an organization. I mean, I remember the early days of Dropbox when we invested, basically Drew and Arash had hired all their best friends from MIT. You know, they were fundamentally all uh, engineering or math whizzes from MIT. And so the benefit that they had was that they could work really quickly and they could get things done. The problem that they had is that no one had seen other things than the other person. And so it was a very monolithic 
culture that served them super well in the super early days, but quickly became a problem. Right. Um, and so, you know, when, when Andrew, and, and I do give the Farfetch folks a ton of credit for this, this notion of overhiring, this notion of like, hiring people from all these different types of backgrounds and all different levels of experience um, has really served them well in terms of being able to just like augment the team and capture so many different experiences that prepare you for a lot of, a lot of stumbling blocks that you're going to have uh, going forward. Well, not now, I hope, but <laughs> you know. None, none, Danny. I think in the early <laughs> stages of uh, any venture that the, the magical phase is going through 50, 60, 70 employees. That's when the CEO cannot wor or the founders cannot work directly with everyone. They have to start working through others. And that's where the, the true character of the company starts to show. And, and that's also, I think, where we as uh, venture capitalists have the biggest value to add to, 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 under to, to help uh, the, the founders in navigating that really important transition period where they have to let go of control, just as Danny said, and where they have to start hiring up and to actually understand that maybe their next hire will, hi will make maybe even 30, 40, 50% more than they make themselves. I don't know if yeah. EJ will agree with this, but as far as I'm concerned, I tell my entrepreneurs I'm a glorified recruiter. Fundamentally, yeah. I spend most of my time interviewing talent and evaluating talent. That is, that, that is what makes companies successful. I was literally just asking, like, how yeah. much do you work, like, of your work with the companies is hiring, but you already answered the question. There yeah. you go, huh. yeah. Just what I think the other, the other thing that, and I think it's, it relates to how you interact with your, your investors is, um, you know, I think ours, and I give Daniel a lot of credit for this, never really put us under pressure to hire fast. They put us under pressure to hire the roles, but not, to do fast. And, and earlier on, one of the, the, the people I hired that didn't work out, I actually, I did feel pressure to hire it fast. And I made the decision. I remember, you know, Danny and a couple of other members of the board saying, look, don't, if you're not sure, don't do it. And I did it. And it was, and I should have trusted my gut. It didn't work out. I lost two years. Um, and, and, and everyone has a different perspective on this. But my advice is to take your time on hiring. I, I'm a very much yeah. a high, I become very, very gun shy on hiring. If, I, if they're the right person, I'll hire fast. But you know, some of the most critical people I've hired have taken, the role has taken nine to 12 months to fill. And I'm yeah. really glad I did it. But it was. It, but you're also opportunistic. If, of course. If you see someone, you don't go through a whole phase of evaluation that's going to be month, months long. Yeah, because I think also as you get you know, in, into the business more and more experience and you've got people around you who can help, you know exactly what you're looking for. Right. I know exactly what I, what I want. It's about finding it. So if you find it, you, you just right. you make the move and you right. go. Right. Yeah. W one last question on the topic towards Stefan, because I know you've hired people in so many countries, because you need to have a lot of local offices to have the local deals yep. and so forth. Yep. Any learnings from, from that when you go and you know, there's a variety of cultures, languages, how do you find the people with the same mindset and culture? Um, I mean, it is a challenge, obviously, as you move into a new market. But um, and we've tried so many different versions, and uh, um, sometimes there were uh, European people being kind of sent out to markets and to to get going at least with the recruitment process and what have you. But I think the winning recipe is actually to find someone local on the ground that's ingrained in the culture. They have the network already. Uh, otherwise, you're going to find yourself with a pretty long ramp up until you actually can scale the business. Uh, so that's my strong advice. Build that network locally as soon as you possibly can and potentially hire someone local to run that market if, if that's your business model, basically, and that's your operational model, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, then moving to a little bit different topic. Um, around the time of, let's say, probably 2017, 2016 for both of the companies, when you know, you're already past, definitely past the start of phase, more like a growth company, a true proper business, but still venture back and privately held, so not... Uh, publicly listed. Um, I like to learn a little bit more about kind of the board, working with the board. How how often does the board meet? Um, what kind of how does the relationship change with the entrepreneurs? Or how what is it like at that stage of a company when it's not anymore finding the product market fit, but it's a, already a real business? Um, so if we start from the like the change of the relationship with the founder, what, is it different 
at that stage when you're already a growth company than <coughs> it was before? Yeah, well, I think the, the, the trust that you sort of build over time uh, and, and then you also find your own role in that uh, mix. And I would say that I had, had a very different role uh, being the board member for uh, at Spotify than I had, for instance, at iSettle. Um, uh, it, because it depends on how that personal relationship plays out and what the, the, uh, the uh, characteristic of the founder team is. And I think that uh, Daniel and, and Martin uh, they, they sought some very specific advice and, uh, and also inspiration rather than strategic decision making. Uh, and so I took it as my role to serve up inspiration for them to uh, find something that really could uh, add to their thinking process. Uh, because if I'm uh, acting more like, uh, like an auditor uh, for them, then they won't appreciate it and they won't need it because they are probably their own worst auditor or, or best auditors, I would say. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I mean, I think, I think that's right. I, there's, there's no rule of thumb. Um, I do think that what changes over time is that in the beginning, you're, you're spending as much time as possible and everything happens in between board meetings. And as the companies get more and more significant, they are surrounded by great executive teams. And so, you know, your job becomes, I think, more making sure that, that the boards are, are being helpful in some really important strategic decisions, but that fundamentally you're not in the weeds trying to help manage the business. I mean, certainly in our case, at Index, we, you know, sort of pride ourselves on the fact that we're not operators. If we were, we'd probably be helping, you know, building companies, but we definitely aren't. So I think that that's a big transition that happens over time. Yeah. How about Andrew and Stephanie both had like fairly high leadership roles in the companies you still have and, and you had. Um, how was, how did board role like show to you or how did you work together or do work together? I mean, yeah, I mean, in terms of the board, I think my, my main frustration, I think, as it's, um, as, as the years have gone on is certainly in our case, we, we, we did, we've done a lot of funding rounds and so the team just gets bigger. So, you know, in the early days, the board is this kind of like, a, it's a team, it's a working group. And actually you can, you can, you can really select people based on, are they going to work well as a team? Just as you'd hire an employee and that's not the only factor, but it's, it's a big factor actually. As time goes on, the types of investors, but fundamentally the size, you know, I think team dynamics exist no matter what the, the setting is. And so, you know, laterally, certainly pre-IPO, I think we were 14 people in the room, something like that. You can't have a proper working session with 14 people in the room on anything. And I think it's, it was a real shame to me because you're wasting, you know, brilliant, brilliant people with great experience. But, you know, and you deal with that stuff outside of it. But I think, you know, you, you have to change how you manage it when the team, team grows. Right. How about in your strategy role? Um, so, yeah, so my experience, um, it was more of a conversation, I guess, um, so presenting uh, the updates of the strategy and, and the work that it's been doing. Um, and uh, more of a conversation than sort of after specific strategic advice, if you like. Um, so that, that's my experience. Yeah. And we, uh, in, the, uh, in the specific example of Spotify and, and when, when Stefan was running the business development side, that was probably the, one of the most important roles that the board members have because we were interacting with the startup community and Spotify was one of the mo most active acquirers. So uh, if there was a startup who wanted to get in touch with the, the, the business development youth, uh, unit for either strategic uh, commercial agreements or even for M&A discussions, that was our role to be the funnel and qualify such discussions. And, and mm. that, that worked really well, I think. Yeah. And I think actually more of the action on my end at least was outside of the meeting to have access yeah. to, to that um, everyone does one on the board for opening doors or just being a sounding board. That was for me the more important part actually. Mm. Right. And how much would you say that at, at that like, stage, how often were you involved or do they work with the board? Is it daily, weekly, monthly? If it's daily, I think there's a problem, probably. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, we started monthly. We always had quite, always had quite long board meetings because they were useful and they were working sessions. Now it's more, I think we're doing five or six a year. So 
you know, and, and they do get a bit more formal, a bit more governance and so on. But, you st but still, I mean, we just had one last week, incredibly useful strategic discussions. But there's a lot going on. And I guess it depends how active it is. Yeah. All right. Moving on 2019 for the last five minutes we have. Um, what are your expectations? What, what do you think 2019 will be remembered of in European tech? Yeah, uh, I think that the uh, European ecosystem really is delivering and has the capacity to continue to deliver really, really uh, well. We have a complete capital market that supplies these, mm. this uh, enormous uh, entrepreneurial talent. So I'm extremely optimistic. At the same time, I think that there is a looming uh, financial market, uh, uh, perhaps correction, uh, that, that we should, as VCs and also entrepreneurs, keep a, a, a good look at. Because if that ha hit, hits, it actually hits the, the smallest, fastest growing uh, entrepreneurs the most and and we should be prepared for that yeah. why do you so, think it hits the the smallest youngest or s smallest entrepreneurs the most well because most of the time uh, when that has happened before the funding activity even if it's available actually slows down quite a lot and those who are were uh, tailoring their uh, growth plans for access to capital when the market slows down they will be hurting. And that's why I think we should uh, uh, yeah. advise our companies. Yeah, I guess from, so, so this might be in a disagreement. I sort of feel like I'm really excited and happy when our companies get to a point where they actually have to worry about macroeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry that you do, but I'm also <laughs> happy, happy for you. Uh, most of our entrepreneurs are not in that situation. You know, they're still growing their companies. They're still pretty small. And they still should be growing at 100% irrespective of, of macro climate. Um, I also think it's very healthy because it separates the folks who are doing it because it's the most popular and exciting thing to talk about. And you end up with the best caliber of entrepreneur and teams who are really dedicated to it because this is, this is their passion. This is like a religious errand that they have to transform a business that they're going after. So yeah, I mean, I definitely think that we have to be aware of market corrections and expect them and expect that our companies have enough money in the, in the, on the balance sheet to weather storms, but it's actually super healthy for the ecosystem. Um, for 2019, I guess, you know, what, I, what we're looking for is um, on the consumer team of Index, because we do a lot of enterprise software. And you know, enterprise software, I mean, open source actually has been a theme that came out of Europe. It was actually one of the first companies that we invested in post-crash was MySQL in Uppsala. Um, but uh, actually, it, uh, I think F Martin Mikos is here, he is. a Finn did an amazing job building and, and, and uh, developing that company. But we've, we've found, uh, you know, what are the areas that are going to be exciting to invest in? And the consumer side, sort of the thinking is that it's just going to get, I was telling PJ this, that we think that it's going to get just more messy. That messy. consumer companies are going to have to have more people and they're going to have to have inventory, and they're going to have to have leases, and they're going to have to have physical imp, uh, sort of representations of what they're about. And so the opportunity is going to be there, but it is going to be not, not as clean as it has been for, for entrepreneurs and for investors in terms of what we could invest in over the last decade plus. Right. So not that scalable, or at least more capital intensive as well. Yeah. But Andrew or Stefan? Um, uh, maybe more of a general observation. It's not really 2019. It's more uh, broadly. And I think with all the success we've seen in, in Europe, uh, all these companies coming up, uh, like two companies we talked about here, uh, there's, there's a slew of great companies out like Taxify, I guess. And there's, there's a bunch of them out there. And what I think is happening in, the, in this sort of wave after a success or a listing, et cetera, is there's a lot of executives and founders coming out of that 
being excited about helping uh, the ecosystem build more companies and be sounding boards, invest in seed rounds and what have you. And that's incredibly exciting, I think. Um, and that would, should mean something for 19, 20, 21 and onwards, definitely in terms of scaling this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just, I know we're out of time, but um, you know, we, when we went public uh, a couple of months ago in, in New York, you know, the actual, the day itself was, was amazing. It was, uh, you know, definitely one of the mo one of, if not the biggest days in my professional career. And that was a Friday. And then Monday, we're back at work and we're working hard. And um, I think that's how you want it to be. And so, you know, we view that the 10 years, the IPO is like the end of the chapter one. You know, that's the first 10 years. The next 10 years are going to be more exciting than the first 10 is definitely our view. And, and so 2019 is the start of that. All right. Looking forward to catching up 28. 2018 then. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank thanks you. for the audience. I guess what's remaining is the announcement of the Slush 100 pitching competition winner. So thanks again. And we'll move forward to the final piece of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thanks. you.